Hello, everybody. I'm Eric Kapitulik. I'm the CEO and founder of the program. The program is a team building and leadership development company. We work with more than 160 collegiate and professional athletic teams and major corporations annually throughout North America. And this is Coffee with Cap. Joining me today is Siri Lindley. Siri is a graduate of Brown University, where she starred on their field hockey, ice hockey, and lacrosse teams. In 1996, she began competing in ITU World Cup triathlon races. By 1999, she was consistently producing top 10 finishes. In 2000, Siri won her first World Cup race at the age of 31. In 2001, she won six consecutive ITU World Cup races and the ITU World Championship title. The next year, in 2002, she maintained her number one ranking while repeating as ITU World Champion. At the end of the 2002 season, Siri Lindley retired to pursue a new dream, helping other athletes reach theirs. She founded Serious Athletes in 2003, and her athletes have won national championships, World Cup races, Olympic medals, world championships, and attain number one in the world rankings. She is the author of Surfacing from the Depths of Self-Doubt to Winning Big and Living Fearlessly. Most importantly, Siri is married to the accomplished and, according to my sister who attended their wedding, lovely <laughs> Rebecca Keat. And together, they run the Believe Ranch and Rescue, whose mission is to rescue horses from abuse and neglect, giving them love, medical care, training, and a second chance that they so deserve, restoring their love and trust in humankind and finding them safe, loving, and permanent forever homes. These rescue horses then go on to transform the lives of their adoptive families. Siri, she has it listed nowhere, so obviously not one of Siri's greatest accomplishments, but one of mine is that Siri was my date to her Brown senior dance. Unfortunately, after reading her book, I realized that it was shortly thereafter that she determined that she was gay. <laughs> Siri, I had one of the great nights, great dates of my life that night. Obviously, you did not. Uh, I appreciate that you are now recovering from cancer, which I can't wait to, to discuss with you. But I'm also equally grateful that you were able to recover from that date. <laughs> Siri, I bought surfacing on Tuesday evening. And as you know, I emailed you at 2 a.m. Wednesday, uh, Wednesday morning after finishing it. I could not put it down. Oh, wow. I'm so fired up to discuss it and so many other topics with you. Siri Lindley, thank you for joining me and us on Coffee with Cap. I am so happy to be here, thrilled to be here. And Eric, that senior prom was the best prom I could have ever <laughs> dreamed of or imagined. And I tell you what, it was the one thing that got in the way of me taking you know, the plunge into accepting the fact that I was gay. So well, thank you for that. Well, I appreciate that, Siri. That's that's tough for me to truly believe, but uh, we're going to talk about how you instill and help to instill confidence in your in your athletes. I'm, I'm glad that you're trying to do it with me, too, because I need that. I need the help, too, on on that topic. But Siri, um, I know that <laughs> and we're going to talk about it. I want to be respectful of your time today. So I want to jump straight in because there's a thousand things, literally a thousand that I want to talk to you about and a thousand things that I feel from reading your book, knowing you, but, but then reading your book where I got such great insight into you and your life, but so many lessons that our audience would just so benefit from. Uh, I just want to jump right into the, to your book. Siri, you talk about your upbringing in it, and 
Siri, as a father now, as a parent, reading about you as a child, as I read that book Tuesday night into Wednesday morning, I had a visceral, emotional response to it. Um, I, I thought of you as a lonely, frightened little girl. And I want to just wrap my arms around you and, and, and hold you as I read about <laughs> you. your your childhood. Siri, I, I believe that we're probably a lot of nature and we're probably a lot of nurture. Can you talk about your childhood, your relationships with both your mother and father during that time and other very important people in your life and the, the impact that they had on you and then maybe later what you would become? Absolutely. You know, it, and, and let me state ahead of time that that childhood made me who I am today. And everything that's happened in my life has made me the woman that I'm really proud to be today. So um, I believe that regardless of what we go through and how it hurts us or pains us, um, that we develop an incredible strength through it. And, and there's always a gift in it. Um, growing up, my mom and dad, um, we had an amazing first three years of my life. I mean, we had the tiny little house and we used to hang out on our, you know, velour couch and listen to Cat Stevens and life was amazing. Um, but they got divorced when I was four and my mom remarried uh, a really famous guy, uh, a Hall of Fame football player, Frank Gifford. They were married for 13 years. Um when they got married, you know, it was the kind of thing I'll never forget the first time he walked into our house. And I just had this feeling, this feeling like this huge dark cloud was coming into our house and I felt afraid. And um, from the moment they started dating uh, for two years, I was a mute. I didn't say a single word. I used to just put on a goldfish mouth and stand like that all day. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the hardest part was that they traveled all the time and they'd go away for like two, three weeks. And, and my mom, of course, at this point, she, she, you know, feels so badly that she had done this, but we have to understand that in that day, like being a wife was everything. Being a wife was the most important job that, that any woman had, or at least that was our belief. Um, so they'd go away a lot and we'd be left alone. And, um, we lived in a huge, huge house that was very dark and, and not, not warm at all. Um, and I was just a young kid who was really terrified. Um, my sister and I weren't particularly close. Um, as we grew up, she kind of loved to go out and, and would take her car and go into New York City, even though she was 14. Beautiful soul, but she, she was living a totally different life. Um, that part was all super hard. But the hardest part came when 13 years after they were married, um, Frank asked for a divorce. And uh, my mom, actually, I should step back a little bit earlier on when they first met and they were dating, uh, they broke up initially and she, it just destroyed her. I mean, she was just absolutely devastated and, and actually tried to, to take her own life. And um, I, I remember running in into my mom's bedroom and, you know, there was an empty pill bottle on, on the side of the bed and, and she was really struggling to breathe and was crying. And, you know, when you see something like that, the person that you love the most in your life, um, that moment never leaves you. And oh. I kind of made it my mission um, my whole life to be the one that makes her happy and, and makes life worth living and fills her life with all the things she needs so that she'll never go away. And when they were married, you know, that was fine. They actually had a, a, a very happy marriage for a while. But when they got divorced, that, of course, brought up that night uh, from when I was four years old. And so I went into panic mode. And it was all up to me to ensure that she was happy and that she wanted to keep living. 
and taking on that kind of pressure. And here's the thing. She never asked for that. She didn't need that. She is the most incredibly strong woman. And but I made up the story in my mo own mind that mm -hmm. it was all up to me and that mm -hmm. I was responsible. But that was a story I made up. It wasn't her asking me. So in mm -hmm. order to deal with all this pressure of feeling like it was all up to me, um, I just developed these insane OCD behaviors um, that I would do, you know, like like seriously craziness, you know, like turning the light on and off, on and off, on and off a million times until I had a freeing thought. Um, it was debilitating. Yeah. And um, but it was it was the only way that I could cope. But meantime, you know, I, on the outside, it looks like I've got it made. You know, I'm a three sport athlete. I'm, I'm, I got into, you know, three Ivy League universities. I decided I'm going to Brown University. Like on the outside, it looks like life is just amazing. But on the inside, you know, I was slowly dying. And um, my mom literally pushed me out the door to go to Brown. I didn't want to leave home, of course. Um, but pushed me out the door. And it was like the best thing she could have ever done because I was being suffocating for her. Like I was preventing her from standing on her own two feet and getting as strong and, and you know, happy as she could be. Like we have to do that ourselves. It's not up to anyone else. So when I left, like my amazing mom just, you know, found her feet and, and, and built her strength up and found friends and, and had a great business going. Like it freed her to become as strong as she is. And, um, and I went off to Brown and that's when our story began, Eric. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Siri, that's very, that's Siri, the amount that's so interesting because you know, the amount of time I've spent since Wednesday morning at 2 AM and me sending you this email in the middle of the night, you're like, Hey, stalker, stop. Right. Like, um, <laughs> But but since sending that email, I've I've recommended it to everybody at the program oh, that it's recommended reading. My wife is is almost oh. done with your book. Our friends are almost done with your book that we see now. Um, and the the question while I read about your childhood is the the tone that I get. I don't know if somebody else has said this to you in in reading the book is that. The tone was that your your parents both had had certain actions, made certain decisions, and had certain actions that impacted you in negatively. I know you said that now that those things have been positives for you in the long run, but at the time, um, you know, hurt. It comes across like you were hurt. It they those decisions hurt you, but it, the tone that I read is that you have a different tone or feeling about your dad's decisions than you do your mom's decisions in but now you you know you, because things like uh that that i didn't get in the book was you saying look my mom didn't ask me to do these things she she was the one who's trying to push me out the door to get to brown i that's not in the book so i'm glad you you highlighted that uh for us so yeah and they were really loving parents i saw my dad every other weekend and my mom was trying to be an amazing mom while also being an amazing wife. Yeah. And my dad was going through, you know, the pain of, of having been going through the divorce. But yes, and yeah. I, I clarified that because I know that's not in the book and I wish it was. There are a lot of things that are in the book that aren't in the book that I would love to speak about today because they're important. Yeah, that's the tough part. We, we, you know, one of my teammates and I, we, we wrote our book and now it's in, you know, got published last fall. And the problem is that once you publish it, then over time you go, God, I wish I had changed this or I wish I, but we don't get that opportunity though from it. Right. Yeah. Um, with that said, if that's the one thing you would change, I wouldn't change anything else. If that's the one thing that you say you would change. And let me ask you about some of those things that you brought up in the book, because God, I want my son and my daughter to, to, to hear uh, to talk about this and just hear your insight. First of all, as you discuss Siri, so let's transition. So you go to Brown, you, you're an unbelievable athlete there. Now let's transition to um, graduation. And now you're living in Worcester and your friend Lynn uh, decides, hey, she's doing a triathlon. You come and watch her. You fall in love with the sport 
and you tell a story in the book about buying your first bike and only Siri Lindley could one day become a world champion triathlete, only you could start off with a 10 speed bike for $100, that the single most important thing to you about that bike was the basket on the front of it so it would allow you to carry around your stereo and ride with music. <laughs> Oh my God! What music were you listening to? This is circa nineteen ninety nineties, right? These are in the the early mid to mid nineties. Yeah. What what music are you rocking out to? Gosh, um, probably like Men at Work and um, what was it, Devo or Diva or um, <laughs> Devo? Like, yeah, Devo. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. All of you may not know that Eric's sister was my bestest friend in the world, so Monique would probably know what kind of music we were jamming to, but it was, yeah, probably like men at work and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, um, well, I've seen my sister dance, so I don't even want to bring up like what you were jamming yeah. to. No, yeah, you, but, don't. Um, you don't. Sierra, but also, Eric remembered yeah. too. So not just that, but I didn't know how to swim. So when I fell in love with this sport, I'm 23 years old and I don't even know how to swim. And I obviously didn't know how to bike. I knew how to run because I'd been running up and down a field. But I fell so in love with the sport. And I'll tell you, if, if it's okay, a little background as to why the sport kind of called me so deeply. Yeah, is It was shortly after I was 23 years old when my dad found out that I was gay. And he called me in floods of tears. Yeah, you and talk about it in the book. I talk about it in the book. And he said, somebody told me you're gay. I, I couldn't possibly have a daughter that's gay. Like, I beg you, tell me it's not true. And, you know, it was devastating. I said, Dad, I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't want to be this way, but this is who I am. Please love me anyway. And he hung up the phone and I didn't hear from him for the next two years. And after that, maybe lucky to get a phone call on Christmas. Let me just say ahead of time, in case we don't get to this, like my dad and I have the most wonderful relationship, as do my mom and I, and I'm so blessed. And that all sorts out life, the evolution of life is incredible. But what that did in that moment is it made me feel like everything that I had accomplished up until that point in time meant absolutely nothing now that I was gay. And I was so desperate to find something where I could find myself and prove to myself, most importantly, that even as a gay woman, I can achieve something that I think is spectacular, you know, that I can inspire people, that I can make a difference in the world and that I could be loved, you know, not just by others, but by myself. And at that time, I really needed to find a love for myself. And this sport to go from, you know, I did my first race. I was dead last. I humiliated myself in every way. I nearly drowned in the swim because I didn't know how to swim. But I had never felt so alive in my entire life. And I fell in love with it. And I said to my mom that night, I am going to be the best in the world in this sport. And she kind of looked at me like, oh, my God, my daughter, what is she? Oh. <laughs> and she said, I'll support you for the next two years. But if it doesn't look like it's going anywhere, promise me you'll go back to something you're good at. Siri, there's so many things in there that are that are powerful and touching in, in this. I, I, I'd love to hear more about, first of all, I have a I have a son and a daughter. Um, if either one is is gay, uh, I, I lo love who you love. Like I mean, be a good person and, and love who you love. What, what is, how does that affect me in 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 any form? As as a parent or as a coach of of an athlete who you may think is gay. Do we wait until that athlete, do that athlete or that child the space to come out on their own terms and then just support them in that moment? Is there something that we can do prior to that as, as a parent or as a coach to help support them get to that decision to come out earlier? It, it's, it's incredibly unfair. I mean, in kindergarten, I remember I dug my female classmates. Like it wasn't <laughs> so like, I. 
it, in and to somehow not be comfortable or have been in an environment where you can't just live your life. That's a horrible thing to ask somebody to do. What can we do? I think, you know, I'm so proud of our country and the people in it for having more of a conversation about, it. I mean, just like what you're saying, love who you love, you know, as when we love people, we just want them to be happy. So like my mom, my dad, they're so happy that my wife like fills my heart and, and, and makes me so happy. And so I think having those conversations of just, you know, getting it out there that like any kind of love is okay. And, and then they feel comfortable knowing that you are accepting of that. But then it's about leaving them until they're ready. And I think about it also, you know, from my side, you know, it took years for me to come to terms with the fact that I was gay, like years. Like I can't expect that when I tell my parents that in two seconds, they're going to be okay with it. It took me years to be okay with it. And I think so from my side, from the person that is coming out, you know, understand that it's going to take them some time. They need to process it. They need to. So don't, you know, think that their first reaction is going to be the end. Yeah. Just give them the time to process it as well. But I think like you said earlier, just getting it out there like, hey, love is love. You can love who you want so that they're hearing these 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 comments of acceptance will make them a lot more comfortable when they know that it's time to come yeah. out. That's interesting. A few weeks ago, we had a conversation on race with a number of uh, black coaches and, and asking them a similar question as it pertains to race with children. They had very similar comments about it was yeah. how, how you and your wife or, or, or in partner, significant other are talking about these things in front of your children. Uh, is equally important as it pertains to race. Yeah. You, you know, so one final piece I'd like to ask ab ab about um, the support you received in, in your parents, and I keep going back to your parents, but one of the things that was written in the book, and maybe this wasn't the case across the board, but at least what you wrote about in the book was that your best friends or your dear friends uh, of which, and I, I had to chuckle that you called my sister really straight, um, my my super straight friend Monique in the book because I don't know what kind of straight is, but <laughs> but but, but uh, the when you talked about your friends, of which some of them I know, Suzanne Bailey, you 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 mentioned of of course, right? Um, but your friends being very accepting of it and and um is important, correct? Absolutely. And, you know, I look back and I think about Monique and, you know, our friendship was so solid, like we were the best of friends. And I can't believe I was so scared to share it with her when I know that she would have just been opened her arms to me and accepted me and loved me just the same. Yeah. But you, when it's so new and so scary, like you just don't know and you, yeah. you think the worst in your mind of what could happen. And um, yeah, but once once I told Monique, you know, she was just amazing. Once I told all my friends, they were incredible. When I told my mom, she was just um, amazing. So that helps so much because it's not like, oh, I'm choosing to... Um, go have carrot cake. You know, it's like, it's like, great, I'm gay. Now what? Now what do yeah. I do with this? You know, um, yeah. but I'm very grateful now because I have the love of my life. I love my life. I, I'm proud of who I am. Um, and when the people that you love and care about, you know, show that they still love you and they're proud of you and that you're just the same, um, that means everything everything. Siri, let me uh, switch gears here and talk because I, this is the challenge of, of interviewing Siri Lindley is I could talk about love, enthusiasm, and joy with you. That could be one <laughs> standalone conversation that could take four hours. I could also talk about, and what I'd like to talk a little bit about um, right now is Siri Lindley, the athlete who 
this could be a three hour conversation about Siri Lindley, beast mode, <laughs> discipline, <laughs> tenacious, tough. Like, I mean, like I, there's so many things you bring up in the book that I, that when I read, I thought, Oh my God, there's so many coaches, parents, and athletes that need to, to read this and hear this. Here are a couple of things that stuck out uh, for me that I'd love to hear um, your, uh, just some color, provide color on that. You talked about your one of your first coaches, y Yoli Cassis. I hope I'm saying her name correctly, yes. Yoli Cassis. And she said, you said in the book that she gave you an appreciation that sport was ultimately supposed to enrich my life, not consume it. Mm -hmm. Yoli taught me to train with gratitude. Can you talk yeah. about that? Ah, oh, it gives, you just gave me goosebumps all over my body. She's just been such a powerful mentor to me. Um, when I first went to her to have her coach me, she said, you need to understand one thing. Who you are as a person is way more important to me than what you achieve as an athlete. And that yeah. right away was like, okay, wow. like it's about being a good person. It's about being a good competitor. It's about being a good teammate. It wasn't about like she just wants to coach me so that I win. And that was super powerful at that age. Uh, just a great reminder. Mm. Um, and she just made everything, everything, you know, we'd go on. I'll never forget. She took us on this huge, like 60 mile ride through the mountains. And at this point, I'm kind of just learning still. And there started to be a snowstorm and it was freezing and she's in the van and she's picking up all the other athletes and oh, I gets, love this story. She gets, I love <laughs> it. Yeah, please. Yeah, tell it. I'm, I'm going like, to get fired up. I'm going to go work out when I get done hearing this thing. But yeah, go ahead. Well, we're like way up at the top of the mountains and it's like snowing and hailing and it's freezing. And everybody's in the car and the heater's on. And Yoli said, Siri, get in the car. You can't ride in this. And I said, are you kidding? I am finishing this ride. This is amazing. It's 60, 60 miles. It's epic. It's snowing. And I wouldn't get in the car. And at first she got really angry as she should have because everyone else is in the car waiting for me to get off. But then she kind of saw that I was experiencing such joy in taking on this challenge, such joy in overcoming the obstacle of the storm and the hail. And she wanted to just let me live that and let me have that. And, um, it was there and we had a talk after, I can't remember exactly what, what we said, but she said, always celebrate that joy and that passion and that desire to, to be doing this, not for, you know, making money or getting a sponsor or winning a race, but because it's something that makes you feel alive. It's something that brings you passion. And because of that, how can you not in every moment of your training feel gratitude, feel gratitude for the opportunity? You know, I used to always think I have two arms, two legs, a strong heart, a powerful mind. I've got the heart, the will, the desire. I am so blessed. And that's how I always trained. But all of that kind of started with Yoli and she was just such a, an incredible influence on me. You, you, in the, in the book, you, you talked about something and it, it's something that uh, spoke to me. It's, it's something that we tell at the program that we we talk and we take exception to when we hear coaches and parents talk about sport, that athletics teach great life lessons. They just say that. Yes. Oh, sports, athletics, they teach such great life lessons. We take exception to that. And we always highlight, no, they don't. No, they don't. Or or not any differently than the theater could could teach great life lessons. That by by definition, the theater does not teach great life lessons. Great theater directors do. Yeah. Athletics don't teach great life lessons. Great coaches do. Yeah. Athletics happens to be the vehicle of which we're able to teach those great life lessons on a continuous and constant basis. When when Yoli talked to you, you didn't want to ride with a slower. Uh, rider, let's call that rider Eric Capitulic. That you didn't want to ride with 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 a slower rider, and and, and said, uh, you know, like, oh, I don't, I'm not gonna, I don't want to do it or whatever. And she had said, Siri, you're riding with him. Like, 
you make other people better. So yeah. end of story, do it. And what struck me was, yeah, that's a great coach teaching a great life lesson through athletics. Yes. Yes. Beautifully said. So true. Um, Siri, talk about, um, I, I love the piece in the, in your book and I'm trying to get through these. I want to be respectful of your time and I'm, I'm trying to get through these as quickly as possible. At least my questions, because I have a thousand for you. So maybe, um, I'm going to, uh, pay you to come on a, a second time I would love uh, that. or something, but yes, there was a great piece in there about confidence and throughout the book confidence kept coming back to me, either a lack of it that you had and then a transformation into having a whole lot of it. Okay. And one of, I feel like it, maybe I'm wrong here. So, so please tell me if I am, but one of the real pieces that struck me was when you talked about training, swim training in New Zealand and that you're in the pool getting absolutely demolished with other swimmers who have been swimming their whole lives in this pool in New Zealand. And you it, you come to the realization that this is how I'm going to build my confidence. I'm going to, I'm going to come into the pool with the sharks and I'm going to just keep swimming. Yes. Can yeah. you talk about that? I can. And, and this relates to it. Everyone can relate to this. Um, I believe that your focus, you know, what you're focusing on in every moment can make all the difference in being confident or not. And so in that moment, and, and this happened, I mean, for years, I was always, you know, well, for many years, I was the slowest in the pool, but this group, they were all better than me. Now I could have focused on the fact that I was the worst swimmer in the pool and they were kicking my butt and they were all better than me. And all that would have done is destroy my confidence. But instead, I chose to focus on, okay, right now they're only, you know, swimming 120 seconds faster than me. And, you know, then the next week, oh, my God, now they're only 15 seconds faster than me on that 100. I'm getting quicker every single day. So I'm focusing more on where I'm headed and, and what I have and the things that are going well, rather than uh, taking the approach that, oh my God, I'm the slowest in the pool. So for me, what I would do, I would just get in the faster lane and hang on as long as I could and then pull to the side and wait until they came back, get, get back on again, just hang on as long as I could. And over time, I was able to hang on a little bit longer, a little bit longer, a little bit longer. And I wanted to make it so bad. Like I, this was my life's mission at the time. So I had to think thoughts that served me, that strengthened me. And, you know, one of the things that saved me from my OCD and from that deep depression that I was going through was that shift in focus. And I want you all to think about this. Like, do you focus on what's missing or what you have? Do you focus on what you fear or you don't want to have happen? Or do you focus on what you love and what you want to create? And biggest one, do you focus on what you have no control over or do you focus on what you have all the control over? Because whatever you are focusing on is going to determine your entire experience of life. The decisions you make, what you accomplish, your joy, your, your joy or your sadness. So in every single moment, I mean, I failed over and over and over again in the years leading up to becoming a world champion. But instead of looking upon it as failing, I looked upon it as I'm learning, I'm growing. Every time I fail or I'm disappointed, I'm learning something, I'm able to change my approach, and I'm growing. So, I mean, I'm a believer that if you're not willing to fail, you're actually not willing to succeed because you can't succeed without failing along the way. It's just impossible. So if you want to succeed, you've got to be willing to fail. You met Omri, our executive producer of Coffee with Cap, right before we came on. At the end of every show, Omri takes the show and cuts it up into one-minute bites that he then we then repurpose. Um, Omri, I know you're listening. That last minute and a half, I want you to cut up for Siri. And I don't know if we're going to repurpose it all. I want you to send it to me. 
so that I can listen to that every morning that I wake up. I can have my wife, I can have my son, my daughter listen to that because Siri, that is so powerful of what our mindset is. What do we focus on? Do we focus on what we don't have or what we do have? One of the other things that really comes that, that I'm struck with Siri and it, you talk about it uh, in the, with your race and using your own words, not Eric Capitulic, using your own words from the book, you're choking at the Olympic trials was be due to a winning, I think the term was that you used a winning obsession mm-hmm. and that instead of being focused on the winning obsession, let the winning become a byproduct of that which I focus on, which is my day-to-day training. It's something, Siri, that first and foremost, I talk to my own children about. It also, in Siri, on, I'd, I'd like you to talk about it, but I would also like you to talk about, because you made mention of something in the book that I wrote down and I reflected on, because my own relationship with my father. After having children, I look through fatherhood maybe a little differently, a different lens. and and and. And, and what my mom and dad did as parents, I look through a different lens now that I am a parent. And so much of what they did, I, I do myself now. One of the things they don't didn't do or that they did very similar to an example that you used in your story was I would score 25 points in a high school basketball game. That game would end. And the first thing my father would say to me at the end of that game was, hey, You missed six of those 10 free throws. (laughs) And what I wanted him to say was, hey, I'm really proud of you. Yeah. You mentioned a very similar example in your own life, in in a relationship with your own father. And I'm not trying to be critical of my parents here at at all, but just simply saying something that I do differently as a a parent and and as a coach as well. But I, I believe that that idea of parents talking always about winning parents always talking about, okay, but you didn't do this, can lead to a winning obsession. And that then you did a great, I mean, a world-class job of changing your mindset. And you give lots of credit to other people in your life, like Coach Brett Sutton, of helping change your mindset to give your best every single day and then winning becomes a byproduct of it. Can you talk Absolutely. about that? Yes. And, and you're so right about all of this. I totally agree. And because um, my dad was the same, you know, I could score five goals in a lacrosse game, but yeah, you, you know, you missed that. You missed that one. It was a shoe in. You should have had that. And it's like, wait a second, like, let's celebrate the victories and then talk about what could have been been better. But thank God I had my mom who was more of a, you know, enjoy it, just be your best. So thank God I kind of had her on the other side. And again, like you're saying, I'm not criticizing how they did things, but it did create this winning obsession. And when I choked, so at the Olympic trials, I mean, first of all, I went into that race for 365 days. I visualized the perfect race the perfect race from start to finish, everything just going magically, crossing the line, making the Olympic team. And you prepared that way though, Siri too. Like, I think a lot of people would just visualize that, but they're not putting in the time. You're living a hermit's life. Exactly, yes. I moved to Australia. You're you're not only visualizing it, you're putting in the training (sighs) that should allow you to have a perfect race. Right. I am work training harder than I've ever trained in my life. At this time, I moved to Australia for six months all by myself. I'm living like a monk. And so there's a couple lessons here because, you know, the gun goes off in the race and I dive in. And within the first 30 seconds, someone has pulled me under the water, dunked me, and I lost the front pack. Now that didn't happen in my visualization. So I choked completely. I completely choked. Little lesson here is that when you visualize, you also have to visualize things going wrong and you dealing with it gracefully, calmly, overcoming it, moving forward, and then being triumphant. But you but have should to. Vis- but we should visualize, though. The power Absolutely. of that is huge. Oh, oh, the power of visualization is huge. 
But what I had missed is that I only allowed for one thing to happen, and that was perfection. And perfection really isn't possible. But that's all I'd allowed for in my mind. So when something went wrong and there was an obstacle, I choked, I froze. I, I mean, I was going as hard as I could, but I was just going backwards. And I finished that. Well, I actually didn't finish that race. I quit. I pulled out, which was, you know, <laughs> devastating for me. And I went into kind of a deep depression over this because it, it was my be all end all. That's the other thing. Like it was like my everything. Um, but Brett, yours, said, yours and most every other athlete who's training for the Olympics. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But Brett Sutton was hard on me. He said, Siri, get out of bed and you are coming back to Switzerland and we're going to train for the duathlon world championships. And so I'm training in Switzerland in the winter time, snow, everything. But it was so smart because it got me back out there again and got me thinking. And what I realized was that kind of the meaning I was giving my time in the sport up until this point was, you know, because I'd lost touch with that dream I had in the beginning and it more became, okay, I need to make the Olympic team. I need to make money. I need to get sponsors. I need to be the best. I need to win. And what I realized was that I needed to go back and focus instead on, wow, like six years ago, I didn't even know how to swim, you know, like, and here I am, I'm racing world cup races. I'm, I haven't had a chance to qualify for the Olympic games. And then I went off and I did the duathlon world championships and I won the silver medal. It's like, I have come so far. Not I have so far to go, but I have come so far. I am so grateful that I have had the strength and the will and the desire and the toughness to get from where I was to where I am today. And so I decided the that duathlon, my- Ziri, The duathlon or what two sports for our audience? Uh, it's run, bike, run. And they have a world championship and everything. And I won the silver medal there in 2000. Yeah. So my new focus- became that I was going to go into every single race. And I, like, I felt so grateful. I felt so grateful that somehow I had found a way to make it to the level that I was racing at from where I was. And I was feeling so grateful that I just wanted to show my thanks, whether you believe in God or the universe, whatever it is. For me, I wanted to show my thanks to God for, for, for these abilities and these gifts that I was blessed with and my mental toughness. And so before every race, I said, I am just going to go out and lay everything I have out on that race course, everything I have to show my thanks that I know I have this in me. Thank you. I am going to use it. I'm going to use it to my utmost ability. And I just started winning everything. That was one shift in focus from focusing on something that was not empowering me, that was not giving me the kind of energy I needed to step into, you know, all my potential, but instead shifting it to something that inspired me and that meant something to me. It, it was important to me. And suddenly I became free. I became free to tap into all the power. And you and I both know we are all so much more powerful than you could ever imagine. And, you God, know, our minds are weak, aren't they? It's just, but seriously, we are more powerful than you could ever imagine. And when you free yourself by focusing on the right things, you know, giving things a meaning that inspires you, that's when you can truly realize your magic. Sir, so you, uh, I told you 45 minutes. We're we can go it. on. I'm I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah, I think I got another 10 minutes in me. Okay, I'm still going to want you to come back on because I've got like an hour and a half in me of things <laughs> that I need to ask you to make me a better human being, Siri. Uh, you uh, already are an amazing human being. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Siri. Um, I'm going to use your own thing that it's it's just about getting better and yeah. I've, I got to get better. Um, the... As it pertains um, to coach to to Brett Sutton, there I mean the the impact he had on your you have a number of coaches, and I would love to give you the opportunity. Like I feel like, quite frankly, 
I, I'm bummed that Renee Spellman wasn't my coach in high school. Like, yeah, you know, so I, I know there's, oh, I mean, as you talk about her and the type of person she is and, and, and the impact she had on you at such a young age, right? When you, when, boy, you don't, you didn't only need that. You didn't only want that influence at an age where you needed that influence of Renee Spellman. I mean, unbelievable. But as it pertains now to your racing career, there are so many coaches that I really like the way you explained it in your book, how one coach brings you to a certain point, another coach brings you to a certain point. And it's not, even though I'm doing this with my hands, it's really not a coach is bringing you to a higher level and then this coach here can take you to an, it's more a different level of what you need in, in that time. It seemed like Brett Sutton came into your life. He was the right person at the right time, at the where you were at level wise to get you to where you were. One of the things that came from that, um, as you talked about him, was talking about him helping you get to the point of focusing on yourself that you have to make a decision Siri you have to do it that a coach can do so much but then you have to do certain things that are going to allow you to get to where you want to get to mm -hmm. and I'm going to bring up coach Sutton in, in a little bit when I talk about your own coaching because uh I love some of the things he did not a big fan of other things right but um but th there's, believe me, there's lacrosse parents and soccer parents in Northeastern Connecticut who are saying the same thing about Eric Capitulic right now. Um, but what are some of the things that he really instilled in you about Siri? This is up to you. And then what did you do specifically? Because a coach can only do so much. Eventually, you got to go and do it. What are some of those things that, that stand out to you? Well, I'll tell you, so when I moved to Switzerland to train with him, it was like, first of all, I was the worst athlete. They were all like world champions, Olympic medalists, and then there was me. But I had never, I couldn't have even dreamed of the training that he gave us. Like I seriously, when he would tell us what we were gonna do on that day, it was so epic and scary and, and terrifying that I would cry in, in my own goggles and think this is, this is impossible. It's not humanly possible to do this. But what was so brilliant because every single day it was like six to eight hours of the most epic, crazy, like, 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 t like just horribly hard things that he was asking us to do. And every day, you know, I would just do my best and, and try and get through it. But after a couple of weeks, you know, one day, like I seriously couldn't move my body and I got in front of him and I said, Brett, like, I, I can't do, you know, what you're asking me to do today. And he kind of like looked at me and looked at the doors if to say, you know, if you can't do it, you need to just go home. You don't belong here. And he looked at me and he said, find a way. And I was just like, oh my God, like, I, okay, I just need to do the best that I can with what I have and try and find a way. And it was brilliant because every single day he was giving me something that seemed impossible. And then he left it up to me, whether I was going to even try, which of course I'm going to try, I'm going to do the best with, with what I can. And every day I proved that what seemed impossible was really possible. So what he did is he put me in charge. He, he directed me and gave me the option basically of like, go and do this or go home. But it was me that had to trust and be okay with just knowing that I was going to just do the best with what I had and take that chance, you know, be afraid, do it anyway. And it led to this incredible confidence. So back to confidence from before you know, that confidence doesn't come from your coach telling you you're playing great or doing great or other people saying, oh, you're, you know, you're so fit, you're so fast. That confidence, that real confidence that leads to the magic in your life comes from you. 
truly feeling that confidence from within. And he knew that it would take me making the decision, me putting myself out there, me being afraid and doing it anyway, and me getting out there and proving to myself that I was so much more than I thought I was. That's what gave me that confidence. Siri, let's transition then real quickly to you as a coach, because you do talk about so much of of Coach Sutton and the influence and other coaches in your life as to who you are, but ultimately you have to be you as a coach. And some of the things that really, uh, when you talk about your coaching, being a youth coach here, that um, I was really interested in and, and made an impact on me was a few things. Number one, being positive and being tough are not mutually exclusive qualities in a coach. You write, I firmly believe you can earn the respect of your athletes without acting in a way that compromises your values. You can deliver a tough message with both honesty and sensitivity. Yes. Yes. Our ability to communicate is key. That's right. You know, they used to, my, my athletes, my own athletes often call me the smiling assassin you know, cause I, I'll deliver this, this massive set in the pool, you know, of like a hundred hundreds. And I'll be like, guys, it's time we get to do a hundred hundreds. This is going to feel incredible. Imagine what you're going to feel like at the end of this. It's going to be so fulfilling. And, but then, you know, meanwhile, they're like plugging away a hundred hundreds as fast as they can. You know, there is, I remember I got really offended once because this magazine wrote, because I am very positive and very optimistic. That's my, that's my nature. Yeah. And they wrote, oh, Siri, you know, she's a cheerleader. And I'm like, a cheerleader? I said, okay, you have no idea what goes on here because my athletes work harder than any other athlete. Well, I can't say that, but they work so incredibly hard. And in my opinion, harder than any other athletes in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's not true, I'm sure. Um, but it's how you deliver it. It's making it fun to me. Like I believe as a coach, you have to be fearlessly authentic. You know, like I wrote in my book for, for about a month, I was trying to be like Brett and it didn't feel right. It wasn't who I was. You know, there were certain philosophies that were me that I could utilize, but I needed to be me. And that means tough, like, you know how hard I worked and I expect the same. And as I demand things from my athletes, I'm still demanding the same things from myself to, to be working hard to become a better coach every single day. I'm not just standing here resting on my laurels. Like I want to be better every day too. Um, so I'm tough, but I'm very fair and I'm very loving and I'm very positive. And I, um, I believe it's 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 the perfect combination because I'm also very vulnerable. I think actually this is probably the most important thing to to be honest. Um, when oh, no. you express that, you know, I've been scared too. I've worried about failing too. You know, I have failed. I've been where you're at. I I have you know quit during the most important race of my life. Like I've been there, but let me tell you what I learned so that you don't have to go through this. Like we want to know, I knew as, as a youngster, like I, the scariest thing of all was thinking that I was the only person in the world that worried, that had anxiety, that felt unloved. Like I thought I was the only person in the world that felt that way. And until some other people started talking about it, mm. it left me feeling so powerless, but you can, give your athletes, your students, whatever it is, more power by letting them know that they're, they're human. We've all been there. We've all felt underconfident. We've all been through these things. So it's being fearlessly authentic. It's being vulnerable, but it's also like, you know, you've got to have your boundaries and you've got to be tough and you've got to be stern. And I say to my athletes, you know, if you are going to do things differently to how I'm telling you to do that, then I believe you should go somewhere else because how I, you know, determine whether I'm doing a good job coaching or not is being able to see how, how my athletes are responding to the work that I'm giving them. 
But if they're off and suddenly they're going terribly and I'm wondering, what have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? And they haven't told me that they've been doing all different sorts of things that weren't on the plan. You know, I need to know that so that they can be the best and I can be the best. So communication is everything. You say, by the way, I'm still trying to get my arm wrapped or my arms wrapped around a hundred hundreds. <laughs> like if I've gotten older in life, I've, swimming has become a, a one of, if not the main form of exercise that I do. And I'm going to need to go into therapy after hearing that <laughs> an, that that one of your workouts is a hundred hundreds. You it can makes, do it, Eric. I believe it in makes you. my it makes my workouts not seem like very much. Oh, Siri, I on that, Siri, on that point though, you you a thing I highlighted it and made a note next to it. And you just mentioned it in your book. You said in surfacing, you said complete honesty isn't always easy, but God, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. And I love your, your thoughts about positive reinforcement is being mutually exclusive than tough. And that's the thing that uh, we try when we're talking to coaches and, and, working with teams that we try to highlight, which is we, we, we use the term standards that here, these are the standards here. Now I'm not going to deviate one little bit from the standards. So this is how you are expected to behave. And if you behave this way there, if you don't behave this way, there's going to be a consequence by the same token. If you do, there should be, a benefit for doing that. Yes. And, but being, if we don't have complete honesty and transparency, well, we don't have trust and without trust, we have no relationship. And that's, that's right. that means us and our wives and our, and our significant others, our, our, our partners and, and, and in our, in our athletes. Yes, absolutely. Siri, let me, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I would like to talk, because just for the audience, Siri and I had the opportunity to talk for a few minutes before she came on. And during those two minutes of conversation, uh, I got choked up just talking to her and seeing her uh, because I've read at length about your diagnosis and now uh, your recovery and, and remission and, and where you are now. Let me let me ask something to you, Siri, as, as I clarify for me. As I read about everything you've put out from, from your initial interview on the Bedhead Chronicles um, with you saying, hey, I've been diagnosed with, with leukemia to the recovery and the remission of just a few days ago. Did you learn, please wait for the end of this question, because did you learn anything through cancer or was your attitude, how you fought cancer, how you're, where you are right now, is it just an opportunity, and I use that term, has cancer just been an opportunity for you to go and attack it, doing the same thing and using the same things that you used attacking all of these other things in your adult life? Or did you truly learn something new through cancer? Wow. Um, I learned a lot of new things. Um, I, I really did. It's been you did, yeah. the most powerful experience of my life. It's been the hardest thing I've ever gone through in my life. One thing I learned, what, well, which I've done in the past. So I guess there's a little bit of both because yeah. the day of my diagnosis, you know, it turned my life upside down and, and, and it was just awful to hear those words, but, but within moments, I remember thinking like, this is not my time to go. Like I have way too much life to live, way too much love to give, way too much work to do. This is not my time. I am going to survive. I will triumph. And that decision is everything. It's like the decision I made that I'm going to be the best in the world in this sport. Like it was crazy and it seemed impossible, but I made that decision. And it meant that every single moment of every single day, I was gonna be disciplining my thoughts to focus on what I had, what was good, what I wanted to create, you know, what I had control over. I created a routine that every single day from the day of my diagnosis until today, and it will continue on, that I do, 
you know, that in the beginning was meant to make me as strong as I could be, you know, to go into the treatment. And then, you know, now it's been so that I can recover from my bone marrow transplant. And beyond this will be so that I stay cancer free forevermore for the next 50 years of my life. So in making that decision, it put me in the mode of, I am only going to focus on the outcome that I'm planning on having. And, um, I tell this story, I'm sure maybe some of you have heard it, but a woman wrote me on social media a couple of weeks after I announced my diagnosis. And she said, I don't understand, you know, why are you so positive? Don't you understand the statistics of you surviving are less than 10%? And at first it like shook me and devastated me. And then I, I wrote her back and I said, I am not a statistic. I am Siri Lindley. And I've proven that the impossible is really possible, and I will prove that again. And it fired me up like it was horrible to hear, but it fired me up. But what I learned through cancer is this. Um, I've always been a giver. I love to give, 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 and I'm not particularly good at receiving. But cancer, you know, gives you no choice. When you are so weak, you have to allow yourself to be cared for. And I learned how to receive the love of my wife, my mom, my father. My mom slept in the hospital every single night for over a month. You know, my wife has been by my side in every single moment. And most importantly, too, I had to receive my own love. You know, you go through something like this, you have to be your own biggest supporter. You have to believe in yourself with all your soul. You have to, you know, talk to yourself, treat yourself, believe in yourself like you would your most beloved because you need every ounce of that to survive. And in learning how to receive, I truly believe that I can now give so much more. Because when we try and give, 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 and we don't fill up, you know, you'll be unable to give as much as you want. But now I can give, 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 and I'm receiving, receiving, receiving. I'm constantly getting this inflow, and I am able to give so much more. And that is the most beautiful lesson. And, you know, cancer has brought my family together. I talk to my dad every single day. My sister was one of my donors. Um, so a lot of beautiful things have come from this. I, I wish I could have received them in another way, but this is how, you know, it happened. And I'm so incredibly grateful to miraculously be cancer free. You know, I, I get to live and um, life is everything to me and I get to live now. And it's a miracle, and I'm just so grateful. Siri, I um, I so wish I could be with you right now. <laughs> the host. Me too. Hey, I'm life glad. is so good, you know. Life is so good. I'm glad, and I hope I get to meet. Uh, I've heard about her, obviously. I, well, I know who she is. I mean, I, I don't live under a rock in the triathlon world, but but obviously Monique, my sister, has met her, and I hope I get the chance to meet your wife very soon and see you personally very soon. With that said, uh, Siri, I'm going to share my screen with everyone and with you. I hope this doesn't cause it to crash. <laughs> In closing, I wanted to share with you. Oh my uh, gosh, look at that. Siri, this was sent. <laughs> uh, this was sent to me a few days ago. Uh, oh my God, I can't believe I'm forgetting. Uh, by Rod. Rodney Wooters. Uh oh. The screen's frozen. This is so incredible. I need to take a photo of that.
Ronnie Zebra Brown. Um, and what I want speaking with you right now, speaking with you today. Um, I think you're more beautiful inside and out than you were 30 years ago. <laughs> Thank you. That is the nicest thing you could ever say. Thank you, Eric. It's this, um, I wouldn't have missed this for the world. Like just to be able to see you again and to have an amazing conversation. I'm just so inspired by what you're doing, what the program does. It's just incredible stuff you're doing. So I'm so grateful to be a part of today. Thank you, Eric, you're, you're amazing. Siri Lindley, thank you so much. You're a beautiful person inside and out. I'm a better person for having known you and knowing you. I can't thank you enough for sharing your insights with us today on Coffee with Cap. And I certainly hope to see you very soon. I love you, Siri. I love you too. Thank you, Eric. Bye. Bye.